So you're studying a difficult passage of Scripture. You're having a hard time figuring out what exactly it means. It's difficult. There are hard places in it. Well, when that happens, this is the rule I want you to remember, folks. You always grab the low-hanging fruit. Welcome back, everyone. I'm Hutch, and this is The School of Faith. It's a channel where we are talking theology, and the idea is that theology is for everyone because you're already a theologian. So what we want to do here is just help make you a better theologian. So we are still looking at uh, the question of general eschatology, which is uh, that portion of last things that deals with... Um, what most people think of when they think of eschatology, so uh, the, the second coming, um, you know, the, the end of the world, um, the millennium, things like that. And so as part of that, what we've been doing is looking at Matthew chapter 24, which is uh, the Olivet Discourse. Now, I've already done a video on the, the first portion of this, and if you guys are interested in watching it, I'll make sure that we link to it at the uh, end of the video. So with that being said, now we're going to once again turn to the text of Matthew chapter 24. And today we're just looking at one verse, but in my estimation, I think it might be the most important verse in the entire text. And so, you know, you're studying a difficult passage of Scripture, and Matthew chapter 24 certainly is. And there's a lot in that text that you have to try and get your head around. But if you want to do that and you want to do it well, the easiest way to do that is to grab the low-hanging fruit. So look for the easiest verse to try and understand, and then you build out from there. So let's go to the Bible. Well, let's take a look at our text. So for now, all we're doing is looking at Matthew chapter 24, verse 34. I'm doing exactly what I did in the last video. I am got up my Greek text here of the New Testament, and I'm just going to translate it myself so that I can kind of draw out what's going on, and then we're going to talk about the text proper. So, Matthew chapter 24, verse 34. Christ is speaking to his disciples, and he says, I tell you the truth, that this generation certainly will not come to an end until all of these things take place. So I want to reiterate what I said right before we came to this text. This is a really easy rule for you to remember when you're dealing with difficult texts of Scripture. So you've got a, you know, a pericope of Scripture, a paragraph or a large portion, and you are trying to, to figure out what's happening in it. You're having a hard time. And so the easiest thing to do is to grab the low-hanging fruit and then build out from there. And so that's what we're doing here. We are... Uh, looking at this specific verse, because I think, in my estimation, if we can get the interpretation of this verse right, then everything else in this passage is going to fall into place. Now, obviously, this is a difficult point in the, um, the, the Olivet Discourse, and there are, you know, in the history of interpretation when it comes to this passage, there are just a plethora of competing interpretations, and many of them are, to be perfectly frank, just bizarre. So, when in doubt, in trying to figure out which interpretation is correct, there are two things that you need to do. Uh, the first one is that you need to look at the language. Right, So we need to look at the, the words that, that are being used by the author. So we look at the surrounding verses, and then we're going to build out from there, and we're going to look at the, um, the, the large chunks that come before and after. And then once we've looked at that, we're going to step back and look at how it fits in all of that particular author's work. And so once we've done that, then we expand out and we look at the whole Bible. So that's what we're going to do here. And so in, if you do that, if you will look at the language and you'll look at the context. Some, this is my rough unscientific estimate, obviously, but I would say that about 90 to 95% of the time, that's going to solve whatever problem of exegesis or hermeneutics, biblical interpretation, that you're dealing with. And so, in my estimation, if we take this particular verse and we accept the normal literal, well-defined meaning of the terms that are used in verse 34, the rest of this passage gets to be a lot easier. All right, so let's look at the passage again. 
Once again, Christ is here speaking to his disciples, and he says, I am telling you the truth that this generation certainly will not come to an end until all these things take place, right? So all, panta, tauta, these things. So we have all coupled with the demonstrative pronoun. So the first thing that we have to figure out is what is Jesus referring to when he uses that demonstrative pronoun? So what are, you know, all of these things? Well, the, the obvious referent given the context of the passage, so the, the immediately preceding verses is... Uh, you know, the gospel preached to all nations, the abomination of desolation, uh, great tribulation, false prophets, the sun and moon being darkened, uh, stars falling from heaven, the sign of the Son of Man in heaven. Uh, all of these are what uh, Christ is referring to by this demonstrative pronoun. And so, Whatever we understand about uh, Christ's use of the, the phrase, this generation, we know that what he's referring to when he talks about these things are the, the, the events that he has been describing in the, um, in the immediately preceding verses. And so now that we know what the referent of these things are, we can talk a little bit about uh, the central question of this particular verse, which is, to whom is Christ referring when he speaks of this generation, right? Hey, genea alte. And so who is Christ talking about when he says that this generation will certainly not come to an end before these things happen? Well, I think the obvious answer here is that it is the, the generation um, that is contemporary with Christ's discourse here. That is the obvious low-hanging fruit, right? That seems to be the obvious answer to the question. And so I would understand uh, Christ's use of the phrase, uh, this generation, Hagen Aute, right, as referring to the generation that was living at the time of Christ, and that that is the generation that would not come to an end until all of the things that have been mentioned here by Christ have occurred. Now, I freely admit at this point that this particular understanding of uh, Christ's, um, Christ's language here of this generation is uh, opposed by many, uh, if not most or all, of those who belong to the Dispensational School of Interpretation. And so, for example, uh, Dr. Lewis Sperry Schaefer, uh, in his book, The Kingdom in History and Prophecy, says that um, this term here, Ganea, uh, means race or nation. And so, yeah, uh, just as a, a side note, you can find that particular quote if you want the full quote verbatim on page 137 of his book. And so, in Dr. Schaefer's estimation, what Christ is teaching is that the nation or race of people, um, the Israelites, would not cease to exist until these things were fulfilled. And so that means that we should take what we've already learned in this video, uh, that we need to examine the language, and then we need to examine the context. So she, we should take those two things and immediately ask, does Matthew use genea, generation, in this way uh, anywhere else in his gospel? And then the next question that we need to ask is, you know, does genea refer to nations anywhere else in the Bible? And so answering those two questions will give us, in my estimation, the, the information that we need in order to critically assess Dr. Schaefer's argument. So if you look here on the screen, I did a uh, quick search for uh, Ganea according to its lexeme. So that would be you know, its appearance in any of its, lex er, in any of its forms. Right, so Greek, the, the form of the word changes a little bit depending on the case, if it's a noun, and depending on the, the, the tense, if it's a verb. 
And so if we look through all of the appearances of Ganea in Matthew, what we discover is that it always has the idea of a contemporaneous group of people. So, for example, if we were to look here at Matthew chapter 1, verse 17, what we read is, Therefore, all the generations from Abraham until David were 14 generations. And from David to the uh, captivity of Babylon, so from David to the Babylonian captivity, was also 14 generations. Uh, and from the Babylonian captivity to the Christ are also 14 generations. And come down once again. Let's go to Matthew eleven sixteen. All right. So, but to what shall I compare this generation? It is like children sitting in the marketplaces and calling out to their playmates. And so, you know, again, if we look at uh, one seventeen, the idea of generation here has to do with uh, the group of individuals, this contemporaneous group that existed between the time of Abraham and David, so on and so forth. When Matthew refers to uh, Ganaon here. He's talking about this generation. He's talking about the generation to whom he is speaking. Uh, chapter 12, verse 39, once again, it says, But he, that is Christ, answered them and said, A evil and adulterous generation seeks after a sign, but no sign will be given to it except the sign of the prophet Jonah. So once again, this is the contemporaneous generation to whom Christ is speaking. Then uh, chapter 12, verses 41 through 42, we read, The men of Nineveh will uh, rise up in the judgment with this generation and condemn it, because they repented at Jonah's preaching, and behold, something greater than Jonah is here. The queen of the south will rise up in the judgment with this generation and condemn it, for she came from the ends of the earth, to hear the wisdom of Solomon, and behold, the, or pardon me, something greater than Solomon is here. Once again, chapter 12, verse 45. Then it, this is a, a reference here in this passage to a demon, it says, and then it goes and brings with it seven other spirits or demons that are more evil than it is, and they enter and dwell there, and the last state of that person is worse than the beginning. So also it will be with this, gener with this evil generation. So once again, in all of these references that we're seeing, the, the phrase, this generation, is referring to a contemporaneous generation. Now, I can go through and read all of the rest of these, but I'm not sure that it's absolutely necessary. Um, but you know what? Let's do that anyway, just so you guys that I'm, know that I'm not trying to mislead you here. So once again, uh, we're going to go to Matthew 17, 17. It says, uh, and Jesus answered, O faithless and twisted generation, how long am I to be with you, and how long am I to bear with you? Bring him here to me. And so, again, contemporaneous generation to whom Christ is speaking is the referent there of Ganea. Uh, Matthew chapter 23, verse 36. I am telling you the truth. All of these things will come upon this generation. Now, that's an important reference because that's in our immediately preceding context when Christ is pronouncing these seven woes on the Pharisees and scribes, and he speaks of the destruction of the temple. And he says specifically that all of these things will come upon this generation, that is, the generation that is contemporaneous with uh, the individuals to whom Christ is speaking. Then we have our text, Matthew chapter 24, verse 34, right, where what we read is, I tell you the truth, that this generation certainly will not come to an end until all of these things take place. And so that's the end of the references in Matthew. So within Matthew, we don't have a single place anywhere uh, where Jesus uses the phrase, uh, hey, Genea, or any of its derivatives, in a way that refers to anything other than the generation that is contemporaneous with those to whom he speaks. Now, 
this is true for all of the other appearances of this phrase in the rest of Scripture as well. So I think that that thoroughly explodes uh, the idea that Christ is referring to anything here other than the generation that is contemporaneous with those to whom he is speaking. So I think it's safe to say, given the, the information that we've looked at, that when Christ says that, you know, I, I tell you the truth, that this generation will certainly not come to an end until all of these things occur, he's referring to his contemporaries, those that, that generation that is listening to him as, as he's giving this discourse. And I want to also draw out here the, the note of absolute certainty that appears in this text. Right, so we have uh, here, I mean, lego humin, I tell you the truth, that this generation, Hagenea Aute, will certainly not come to pass, come to an end, right? And so you have this idea that it is will certainly not going to come to an end here, where we have U me perelthe. Right? And the reason that I've translated it that way is that it will certainly not come to an end is because we have a double negative here in Greek. Now, Greek is not like English. Right, In English, if you have a double negative, the negatives kind of cancel each other. And so, for instance, if I were to say in English, I am not not going to the movies with you, the, the two negatives there cancel each other. And what I'm saying is that I am going to the movie with you. In Greek, when you have a double negative, it serves to intensify the negation. And so we have ou me, right, which is a very, very strong negation in biblical Greek. And so that's the reason that I have translated this as Christ saying, I am telling you the truth that this generation certainly will not come to an end, parelthe, until all of these things occur. And so if we want to know to whom is Christ referring here, the answer is simple. It is to this generation. It's the generation that's his contemporaries. All right, so I hope that helped you guys as we're trying to understand this passage. As I've said, I think that really is the key text to getting a proper understanding of what it is that we are talking about in this particular text. And that's going to become very important as we look at how the text is divided because this text is the turning point uh, in the Olivet Discourse as Christ is answering the two questions of his disciples. We're going to look more at that in our next video. I've already got some notes uh, written up about what I want to say there as I've been looking at the passage. So come back and uh, watch the next video because it'll be coming, uh, God willing, in the next uh, five or six days. So thanks everybody for watching. Y'all take it easy. Hey guys, thank you so much for sticking around for the end of the video. If you guys are being helped by the content that I'm putting on the channel, please subscribe so that you can get notifications. If you enjoyed this particular video, give it a like. And by all means, please leave a comment if you have questions. Once again, thank you so much. God bless.